Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, to hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I'm the E of ENT. I only care for ears. I've taken care of tens of thousands of ears with hearing loss and performed over 10,000 surgeries in my career. I'm also the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center and author of a book called Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, we have a great distinguished guest. It's Dr. Kara Flexner. She is a professor in audiology who received her doctorate in audiology from Kent State. And then she was at the University of Akron for uh, over 25 years as a distinguished professor in audiology in the School of Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology. She has subsequently retired from that position, but told me she is not retired. Special areas of expertise include pediatric and educational audiology. She continues to lecture extensively nationally and internationally and has authored more than 150 uh, publications. She says she's still busy out there giving presentations such as this and talking about her passion, which is audiology and communication. Carol, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, this is great. And so tell me a little bit about how how you uh, got into audiology. Everybody has their own kind of uh, course or way to get there. So how, how did you end up in the wonderful field of audiology? I just fell into it. I started out years ago at the University of Colorado in nursing, and then it was a five-year baccalaureate program in the olden days, and I decided, I think I wanted to be a doctor, and then I decided I didn't, and I thought maybe a dentist, and then I ended up in broadcast journalism kind of a natural segue, right? Sure. And, and there, what undergraduate, the degree was speech. And so you had to take all sorts of courses in speech, took one in speech language pathology, and which I had heard of. And then in speech language pathology, there were a couple of weeks of audiology that I had never heard of. You know, a lot of people knew someone with hearing loss growing up, or I, I'd never heard of it, never. It was like out of the blue, and I fell in love, passionately in love immediately with audiology. It had communication, it had technology, it had talking, it had medicine, it had helping people. It was everything that I wanted to do, and I never looked back. That's that's a wonderful story. That's really great. And then so not only did you fall in love with the field of audiology, you pursued a doctorate and then became a professor, right? Yes. Yep, that's right. Yes, I uh, got my doctorate at Kent State University. And well, let me just back up a little bit. I started at the University of Denver. I I graduated from CU, went to the University of Denver for a master's, and then from there went to work at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. Um, I was like one minute ahead of the graduate students that I was supervising in (laughs) clinic. And but I loved it, loved it, loved it. And from there, I realized that if I really wanted to teach and make a larger contribution, I needed a PhD. And Texas Tech didn't offer one then. And so I um, applied different places and ended up at Kent State University, where I got my PhD, and then went to the University of Akron for the rest of my professional career. And always was really interested, not just in diagnostics, but in rehabilitation, in working with children, teaching them to acclimate to technology, to listen and talk. Now, when I started, there were no cochlear implants. We were just starting with emittance audiometry. I fit body aids on on baby. Well, we didn't have that many babies in those days, right? Only if parents identified because we had no newborn hearing screening in those days. So it was a body aid with a Y cord. That's where I started. And so from there, it went on to how can we better help children learn to listen and talk if that's what the families want. And from there, I started really getting interested in neurophysiology and in the brain because, of course, we hear with the brain, the ears are the way in. And so I've really spent a lot of time developing, I mean, of course, we all know it's about the brain, but developing sure. narratives that can about the brain and about how technology impacts the brain in a 
family-friendly, child-friendly narrative that can make sense to people. And that's what I've really been spending a lot of time on. Well, that's a wonderful project. And that actually uh, leads me to how I stumbled into you, if that makes sense. And so one of my prior guests sent me uh, uh, the link to your article that you were an author on. Um, it's in uh, the hearing review and it's uh, it, it, it doesn't really reveal the title. It's the Hearing Aid Programming Practices in Oregon, Fitting Errors and Real Air Measurements. And this is from 2017. And so can, you, do you, rec you recollect the work, obviously. Can you tell me a little bit about that study and what you guys were looking at? Well, yes, this is, I was working primarily with Ron Levitt, who yep. he and he and I have done research and worked together, I'll bet, 30 years. We were very young when we started collaborating. And and so um, our, our concern was that these pre-programmed, out of, right out of the company ways of fitting hearing aids. First we, fit is what you're yeah, talking the, about. Exactly. That's what I mean. That um, they... We didn't really have evidence that those were effective. And and Ron is he has a very successful private practice. So he sees many, many people on a day to day basis. And he has a consumer group where he does actually has a whole group of people that he can work with when he tests out some of these project ideas that we have. Now, um, so Ron and I did really realized that we need to we need to get some data about this. We need to get evidence. We uh, this the sense is the first fit is is not going to be going to fit everybody or maybe anybody really, and we need to find out about that. So we set up a study to compare what the the best first fit is as recommended by companies on major hearing aid companies. And then compare it with even an older hearing aid that we used uh, an NAL formula fitting and did real ear on to see what the difference is. And so what we to, to translate that for some of the listeners, okay, first fit is the prescription that's put in the hearing aid based on an algorithm developed by the manufacturer of the hearing aid off of the patient's audiogram. That is correct. It, it's an auto-generated prescription, if that makes sense, by an algorithm. And then what uh, Dr. Flexer is talking about in terms of the NAL, there is the National Acoustics Laboratory, which is in Australia, but they have a standard of how hearing aids should be fit from a methodology in terms of what is actually the prescription and what the prescription should do. And then there's a device called Real Air Measurement, which measures the output and tells you whether or not you are where you are and whether or not first fit is what that delivers and what the, if you're delivering the NAL method, whether or not you're actually getting a prescription that actually treats people's hearing loss. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's an excellent summary. Yes. And what real ear does is there's a microphone that's in the actual ear canal. So what we're measuring is what is the sound pressure level at each frequency that actually is coming out of the hearing aid that's set and that we can measure in the person's ear canal. And is actually accommodating for the size, shape, length, Yes. Uh, the patient's actual ear. That's exactly right. Because we all the ears are different, right? The ear canal, all of that's different. And so the size and shape, volume, everything is going to absolutely influence the sound that is in that ear canal. So to think that the sound that's coming out of a hearing aid, even though that sound is based on a person's pure tone thresholds, that that sound is going to be right for everyone because see that that initial sound does not take into effect the actual anatomy of that person's ear. Yeah. So, by example, if you had a speaker with an amplifier playing music, it would be substantially different in a gymnasium as compared to a powder room. Yes. Although yeah. it puts out the exact same sound from the speaker, the the chamber in which you play it affects the actual quality of the sound. Yes, that's an excellent description of that. Yes. And so uh, from my read of the study, he basically had comers. In other words, he just started screening people who were presenting to his clinic who had had hearing uh, treatment or hearing devices from outside places, and he was evaluating them whether or not they actually met what they should to treat the patient's hearing loss. Is that a fair assessment? That's right. That's right. Because we were assuming that the NAL, National Acoustic Labs Formula, Correct right, that was developed um, in Australia based on research, we're assuming that that is an accurate indicator of what that person should be receiving. If receiving. that's not, we're in trouble. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Because I mean, as so- a as an industry, as a as a meta, as a field, that's our assumption is the gold standard, correct? That is correct. That is correct. So we were seeing how do had these people who walked into the clinic with these already hearing aids, um, and they were already fit by whomever. How did they measure up to what an NAL formula said would be best for that person to receive? And when we say that person to receive, we mean their brain. You see, what gets to the brain is what the brain has to work with, not only organize the auditory information, but also neurologically to keep that brain tuned in and the auditory centers integrated well with the rest of the brain, including that prefrontal cortex, which is so important for problem solving and emotional control and attention. Right. And so the to me, uh, the reason I sought out you guys as the author was um, the results were kind of dumbfounding to me, to be honest with you. And so uh, you found over 97% of hearing aids actually did not meet NAL2 standards. No, that is correct. Those that had the first fit did not meet them. Now they could meet them. They could be adjusted to meet them once we did the NAL settings on them. Right, but these were all comers, right? In That's other words, correct. That's people correct. People walking, uh, you know, who perhaps thought that their hearing loss was addressed, but you were finding that many of them were undertreated, meaning they didn't actually get the amount of volume they needed yes. uh, to actually hear as well as they could. That's right. That's right. And, and the thing is, a, a person doesn't know they could hear better, right? I mean, how would you know? That- well, I tell everybody that all the time. You yeah. don't know what you don't hear. Yeah, you're absolutely. How could you? You couldn't possibly. So then even so, if a person, if, for example, an audiologist or anyone thinks that if a person says, I hear fine, or these hearing aids are great, that that really means they're great without testing. It's not that the person isn't being honest, it's that they, they don't have a standard. They know what they hear, maybe the difference between without technology and with technology, and hopefully it's better with technology. But or less bad. Have, or less bad, exactly. They just don't know how much better it could be. Sure. Yeah, well, I, I mean, one of the things that might take, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, to me, you know, there are so many complexities in terms of how the brain affects and compensates for hearing loss that subjective assessments of hearing loss are really not very uh, powerful things. Now, you certainly want people to be subjectively happy. But I mean, you know, similarly, if you look at the uh, literature surrounding surveys, right, like they're all of these indexes and assessments and all of that, one of the things that when I went back and looked at them, they actually don't correlate with the hearing test, meaning your perception of how you score on the survey does not reflect what you actually have as a hearing loss on the measurement. So even patients' survey responses don't correlate with measurement. Right. That's right. I know. That's so interesting, isn't it? Because we would think that it would. And there are so many surveys that we do about a person's um, noticing of their hearing loss or of their child's hearing or how their child is doing or even how long their child is wearing their technology every day. That that doesn't even correlate with, with our data logging in many yeah. instances. Which is fascinating, right? Because you're talking about a sensory deficit and then asking people, how do they sense? Yes, exactly. And so, uh, and so I, I, I and it's, it's a, you know, I, I think what's happened is there's been some co-founding of motivation for treatment, which mm-hmm. is different, right? Because if you perceive it, you're more motivated right. with actual disease state, meaning there are people who have extensive hearing losses who are not motivated at all. And people have very slight hearing losses that are highly motivated because of their uh, assessed impact on their life and willingness to make those changes. Right. Exactly. Yes. And and those that that whole idea of um, could could my life be better? Could I be more social? Could I all of what we know that having auditory brain access can do, especially in a communicative context? Um, is not necessarily realized by people unless there's a conversation about it or unless they're in a particular either social or work situation where it's clear to them that they're not hearing. So so here's an issue about that um, that awareness of what you're hearing or not hearing. And that is that most people 
do not want to be unkind. In other words, most people will not say to someone, you know, this is the fourth time I've told you that. Or, no, you misheard me once again. Or you realize you're making me work extra hard because you're not taking responsibility for your hearing loss and wearing hearing aids. So you're putting that responsibility on me as a talker. So, no, I'm actually getting pretty resentful of being around you all the time and you're not managing your hearing. No one's going to say that, right? Except spouses and Except grandchildren and, spouses. and, and right. kids. <laughs> Why? Maybe that. But most people aren't. But what happens when people don't give that sort of feedback is it can per perseverate the person's denial that they really do have a hearing problem because they'll say, well, you're the only one who tells me about it. No one else comments. Everyone else thinks I'm doing great. It yeah, must know, be your problem. You know what I tell people? I say only the people who in your life are willing to tell you your zippers down will tell you <laughs> hearing loss, right? Because That's right. <laughs> like, so if somebody walks around with, with their zipper down, everybody knows your zipper's down, but I don't, like, if I were walking in a show, you know, at a store, I would go, hey, buddy, your zipper's down. You just won't do it, right? And no. so it's that type of intimacy it takes to address something that's so uncomfortable. But the fact that people don't socially validate it doesn't mean you don't have it, right? That's, so, that is right. I, I mean, I think the other impact in that scenario that you've described is what I'd call a micro disconnection. And so each time somebody gets frustrated like that, they think twice the next time about whether or not they're going to say whatever they're going to say, because they don't want to repeat it twice. And then after the two times repeating it, say, never mind, this isn't worth it. They start not saying things because it's not, it's too much effort. And so you actually gradually get disconnected from people because frankly, regardless of whether or not you care about their your hearing loss, they do, and they're not going to compensate for it for forever. Mm -hmm. That That's a really good point. Exactly. That the, the, what happens or as you say, are people stop communicating or stop communicating in depth, you right. know, it's easy to have the, Hey, how you doing? But no, or operational really stuff. Yes, Let's eat dinner. Yes. Come right. on, it's time to go. Not, hey, how are you feeling? And let me tell you a great story about a funny thing that happened to me today. It's not worth it. It's, it's, you have to say it four times, you're not going to do it. Like jokes aren't funny if you have to keep on setting it up where you say it four times before you get to the punchline. Nobody thinks it's funny. <laughs> That's right. And it isn't funny after the fourth time. Right, right. right. So again, so this person is missing. And you also can't have asides with the person. The little quips that we have, oh, look what happened over there. Well, yeah. they're not going to catch that. So then you stop. That is a level of intimacy where you can have these little asides with someone. And yet, if they aren't wearing their technology, that's just not possible. Yeah, no, no, I agree. And so getting back to this study, I mean, you know, when you look at real ear measurement, which is the measurement to determine, I mean, we know that, I don't know, six out of 10 audiologist offices and a little bit less of the dispensing, hearing aid dispensers offices have these real ear measurement devices. Are they not being used or I'm I just, I'm having a hard time understanding how so many people could present with underfitted hearing aids. Yes, they um, they tend to, these devices, these fitting, they, they tend to not be used. It takes time. It takes some time rather than just quickly e entering the thresholds that you got in your quick quick test and, and then just letting the hearing aid do the work. You see, when you do real ear, you've got to do the work too. You, right. It takes, it's extra time, it's extra work, it's extra expertise. Um, it may be doing some additional adjustments. And sometimes when we, we adjust the hearing aid to meet target, initially it may be too much for the person right. too because loud. the brain is just not used to that, that amount that, that the whole bandwidth and the loudness, as you say, of sound. And so the person might initially say, oh, hang on, I don't like that. Well, now it's going to take several more visits to you as an audiologist, isn't it? Because we're going to need to gradually help them adapt to the sound rather than saying, oh, hang on there, you know, pull up your socks. This is what's good for your brain. Just you'll get used to it. You know, right. of course we can't do that. So we have to gradually and some hearing aids have multiple programs so you can set them each program a bit more. But sometimes you just need to help someone along and they need to return to the office more times. And and that's maybe not perhaps that's not viewed as cost effective, even though I see that's our job, right? Well, I mean, I guess the, the, the contradistinction to that is how many patients either echo their dissatisfaction
agents would become our best marketers of the te- of the treatment because they actually were doing well. But if ninety seven and a half percent of them aren't doing well, why would they tell anybody else to do it? That's a really good point. That's such a good point because how someone talks about their experience is the, as a huge influence on what someone else is going to do. And so it really is to our whole professional advantage to make sure everyone hears the best they can so that that's, that's the word that will spread. Not that, well, you know, I think I hear better with them and they're not so bad, but, you know, I, I only wear them every once in a while. Right. Sometimes get like, I only need to hear every once in a while. Most of the time, there's nothing I need to hear. You know, which yeah, is I mean, not the case. when your spouse whispers sweet nothings to you, why would you want to hear that? Right, exactly. Yeah, when, <laughs> when someone wants to have a more in-depth conversation with you where you really have to hear and think and respond, why would you want to have that level of relationship with someone? I mean, of course you would. Right. But it, unfortunately, you don't know when it's coming. No, no, you don't. And so, and so do you think it's trending any better? I mean, you know, since that, that study was published, do you think that that drew any attention or led to any changes or? I would hope so, but I'm not sure that it does because now, of course, we have th- this whole other feature of over-the-counter hearing aids. We have over-the-counter, then we have the prescription hearing aids from an audiologist. So talk about the over-the-counter being best fit if it's even whatever kind of fit it is, depending on what that over-the-counter device is, it's hard to know. Are are people going to be happy with those? Are they going to be happy because they're maybe perceived as less expensive? Is is that an issue that will make them happy? Are they going to hear so much better that they're going to rave about them? Or are we just digging a deeper hole for ourselves? Well, my personal belief is that we externalize the barrier to the patient and expense when we actually weren't delivering what we were promising. And so it's much easier to say people don't want to pay for them than it is people pay for them, they're disappointed with the outcome, and that undermines getting other people to pay for them. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's that's a really good way to look at it. I mean, again, so if you want to talk about these products, I mean, not obviously not everybody can have an iPhone and not everybody can have a Tesla, but if you look at those products, they are premium priced. And people, I never hear anybody say those are too, I mean, not and never, that's not true. But oftentimes, people are certainly willing to expend further resources to obtain those things because they believe the experience outweighs the increased price. Right, right. That it's, it worth, it's worth the cost. It's right. worth it to them to give up something else in order to have that thing. And that's what we don't seem to be seeing in many of our hearing aid patients is the willingness to give up something else in order to really hear better. Right. Yeah. Or, well, or, I mean, I think that unfortunately there's a, and so this is a patient population I see not infrequently, Mm. people who have serially invested, not in substantial amounts and Mm. still are not getting a good hearing experience. And so I think one of the issues is is when you're talking about over the counter is if you can get first fit algorithm fits over the counter and an over the counter hearing aid which is the same as what you paid a professional to deliver to you and they charged 5x what it was why would you pay 5x if you can get the exact same hearing prescription Mm -hmm. over the counter i mean so if you use first fit you're not actually offering a professional differentiation Mm-hmm. Yeah, so true. You are not. You're not offering any expertise that the person, the patient can't get themselves. Right. Just at this pick, point. Yeah, at this point in time. That's right. So, so go ahead. So I was just going to say, so as audiologists, it's very important that we distinguish what is it that we have to offer patients that they just can't pick up at CVS. And what we have to offer is the expertise to make sure that that hearing aid has been set in a way, doing real ear measures to obtaining objective data that will give their brain the best possible signal. And that's what we have to offer. And then we also offer information about how to improve listening, about how to take care of that device, about issues in different environments and noise and distance that are going to have an issue, and also to be to use remote microphones. I'm a big, of course, I work with children, and I fit remote microphones, either the mic accessory that comes with many of the hearing aids and cochlear implants. Um, And of course, then you have a more advanced um, mic accessory or microphone for school. But 
But it's critical to be able to have that mic accessory to get, especially when you're developing this brain, when you're developing the whole auditory cortex, you can't miss words. You can't miss hear words and you can't have distance and noise corrupt the information that is we can be received by this child. So I think remote mics are another feature that audiologists can really offer and explain the rationale for them, given the lit, the living situation of the individual. That's interesting. I, you know, I, I've always thought about it as signal to noise in noise, right? But your distance in noise, that's a, I mean, not that it doesn't make sense. It's just a concept I never really thought of. Is that in the, the literature as a described phenomenon? Yes, it is described, and it is a, the, the the science is signal to noise ratio, and right. what influences that, of course, it's is distance, distance and it's noise, distance. and and the, the signal whole is coupling. attenuated by distance. That's why. Yes, that's exactly right. And then you add noise, and then the size of the room, and all of these other confounding variables, and you're really going to get the best signal to the brain with a remote mic that's close to the talker. Well, that's why people love TV ears. Yes, exactly. Uh, the sound goes directly from the TV to your ears and doesn't have to travel across the room right. or distracting other sounds or anything like that. But the problem is, is that's not a substitute for hearing treatment with hearing aids because you can't wear them and talk to your spouse when you got TV ears on it. No, no. I think there are some where you can turn off. There's some, I don't know. But, but the point is, that's not a substitute for actual having a wearable device, no. And so what do you think is going to change any of this? Do you have any insight into that? I mean, you've been in the field for a little bit of time, so. Long time. Um, I'll, I'll know, let you say that. I'm not going to say that. Oh, <laughs> for almost 50 years, I was very young when I started. No, I, but so here's the thing. I thought when I started that I wouldn't still be having these conversations in this day and age. I thought, especially for children, about because we can diagnose them at birth, I, I thought we wouldn't be having conversations about wearing technology and about what it took to develop that auditory brain. I thought that our technology would be good enough and our skills would be high enough that we would be way beyond the conversation that we're having now. So uh, can I predict what it would take to actually move us forward when I feel like we still have so far to go? I don't know. Is it doing the job better? As you say, it's making sure people really, their brains really do receive quality auditory data. And I don't know how we can make sure that happens. Well, I guess what I would say is, um, I mean, my opinion of this is it, okay. it, that it, 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 it's not the technology, right? I, I think it's the application of the technology that yes. is our problem, right? And so the example I use is it's the painter, not the paint. And it's the mason, not the bricks, and it's the carpenter, not the wood, and it's the hearing care provider, not the hearing aids, right? And so until we uh, require a higher level, I mean, you know, if you extrapolate out the numbers, if 97.5% of patients are getting first fit and not getting real ear measurement targets to NAL2, what does that speak about 97.5% of the people who are fitting hearing aids? Yes. It says that we're not training this, our students well. That maybe not. we are. And maybe it's some loss somewhere in between. I don't know. I mean, I, I would tell you when I talk to students, it's in the textbooks. It's it is in, in training. The and so it's, you know, somewhere it's getting lost, unfortunately. And I think it is, this is, to me, the fundamental issue of what's going on in hearing treatment out there. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a that's a really good point. And I, I think you're right. As you say, this information is in textbooks and it therefore should be in classes. But it's when the students get out there for their internships and they're actually out there in different clinics and hospitals that they see a different application of the information that has been learned in the classroom. But it's in the standards. I mean, both. Um, yes. Both the audiology professional societies and the Dispensing professional societies having their standard of care using real ear measurement for validation of a mm -hmm. prescription. Yep. So it's there. It's just, you know, and so it'll be interesting to see. I do know there is an underlying movement for people to develop standards, minimum standards, not maximum standards, to try to, you know, have some way to hold people to some sort of standard of care. I think the other issue, obviously, as you know, is 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 the practice of this is varied in terms of definition on a state level and varied in licensure on a state level. So you can't really pass a federal law. You'd have to go state by state by state to tackle this issue. Yeah. Yes, you would. So, That's right. So. 
And and money. and also n- not only doing real ear and NAL, that's one huge piece. But I also think we're not doing enough speech perception testing, enough testing and noise, at testing Agreed. at different levels. There's that there's a lot more skills that audiologists can bring to the table to really provide good information and good fittings for for patients. And Agreed. We just should be doing it. Agreed. I mean, to me, the audiogram is like the beginning. Yes. Of, of the workup for hearing loss. And many, most patients believe, you know, they'll ask me, you know, can I get a cochlear implant on the audiogram? I'm like, no, I mean, maybe, but it's not the right task, right? And so it, 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 there is a lot of um, even, you know, other hearing professionals who oftentimes, well, you're hearing so poor, um, you qualify for a cochlear implant. And then when I describe what the testing is, is it's nothing that they've ever had um, done before. And, and, you know, in the defense of my colleagues, they're trying to get them to hear better and the hearing aids aren't working for them. So I, I don't, I want them to send them, but there is a subtlety in terms of what actually testing to determine, for instance, cochlear implant criteria is, is much more sophisticated than a, you know, right, left hearing with a, in silence, no amplification yes. uh, audiogram. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So the first thing, of course, is to refer a person if you have any concerns or they do to so they can get this really good testing. So here's another issue that sometimes happens in different different settings is that there's a disconnect between hearing aid audiologists, cochlear implant audiologists, and they're there often is they may be in different buildings or in different parts of a building so that there's often um, not a good continuity of patient care um, going from one technology to another. Or what if you have a bimodal fitting? You have a hearing aid in one ear, an implant in the other, and they do need to be adjusted to work together. But what if they're, everyone's in different places? They're, and and uh, some centers have it all together. They're centers of excellence. They really are, are, are all together and how to best manage a patient. But sometimes things are very kind of Topsy turvy, and yeah, just to I, I agree with you 100. percent I mean, this is a little bit of a micro example of our policy. We basically tell people we believe we can get a better hearing outcome with the two together, um, and we tell them if you're going to do them apart, that's fine. But you have to sign an acknowledgement that you know that this would likely perhaps compromise your hearing outcome, and you can't hold us responsible for your hearing outcome if we're not treating both ears. Yes, because it's just too yes. hard. I mean, to to do that, and so and getting people to understand that is hard in terms of not to understand. You have to acknowledge it, but to get them to understand the underlying philosophical reason for that acknowledgement is, and and that's where the work is, right? So you can't just say, "Here, sign this." You're not going to get your hearing aids here. You actually have to educate people as to why it actually makes a difference and why you believe coordinating the care with both ears together is really the best way to deliver care. Absolutely. And take it to the brain. It's all about how are we going to get a cohesive coordinated signal to the brain where the meaning is actually extracted and learned. And and so, yep, it's and, and that takes time, right? That meaning having these conversations, having the explanation of why we're doing what we're doing, um, that that takes time as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate your perspective and I really appreciate that work. Um, that to me is a sentinel uh, piece of work, um, you know, and it actually interestingly followed up on. If people read the paper, it, it makes reference to a Consumer Reports article that was published in around 2009, where they showed two thirds of hearing aids uh, were not adjusted correctly to treat people's prescription. And I, my jaw dropped when I read 97 and a half percent. So that that was a really, I mean, I was like, wow, I thought it was two thirds, but it's even, even um, more, even more, or even sadly worse. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that from a personal point of view. And so, uh, Carol, what, what's your favorite sounds? Well, I have to say, I am a water person. I love being in the water and any water sounds, I mean, obviously ocean sounds, but I even love swimming in a pool and I just love the sound of the water as I go through it. That's just my most soothing favorite sound. Doesn't have to be an ocean. That's nice. But any water sound I like. That, that That's really wonderful. And and uh, wow. And that, that gives you a lot of options in terms of what you like because... Uh, there are a lot of different uh, wa- water sounds. So uh, again, um, for the audience, this is uh, Dr. Carol Flexner. She is a, a retired uh, distinguished professor of audiology from the University of Akron, but she is retired from that position, but she is not retired. She continues to work. 
Uh, Carol, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, how would they do that? Well, they can. I have a website. It's C Flexer, um, just carolflexer.com, www.carolflexer.com. Carol Flexer. You have yeah. all. Yeah, right. And so you can so you can reach me there. There's a that's the best way, I think. Easiest okay. way. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great uh, conversation about a really important topic and I appreciate you discussing uh, one aspect of your research with the audience today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.